Hello and welcome to this talk on 25 years of OCaml, including a short history of Camel logos. The reason for this talk is this announcement that I sent 25 years ago in May 96, announcing the availability of Objective Camel version 1.00, which was the latest version of the OCaml language, the Camel language at that time. And to celebrate this and to reflect on what happened since, the uh, OCaml workshop organizers invited me to give this uh, prospective talk, and it's my great pleasure to do so. Actually, the story starts well before 1996. Let me move back 25 more years back and to the early 1970s and talk about the work of uh, Robin Milner, perhaps the most inventive computer scientist I have ever met. So, uh, in 1971, 1972, uh, Milner was working on an interactive prover for a logic, LCF, the logic of computable functions. And the prover would work this way. Uh, users would write proofs as terms, uh, little programs uh, as of type THM, meaning theorem or proposition that is valid. And, and THMs would be built using uh, uh, functions that reflect inference rules of the logic. For instance, this is the uh, inference rules for transitivity of equality. Trans T1, T2 checks that T1 proves uh, A equals B and T2 proves B equals C and then it returns a theorem saying that A equals C has been proved, otherwise it would fail. And to write these terms, Milner wanted a meta-language uh, that was applicative, functional, interactive with a readable print loop and strongly typed to enforce type abstraction on type THM. It is crucial that uh, the only THMs that can be manipulated are those built from the axioms and the inference rules of the logic. It, the user must not be able to claim 0 equal 1 is a theorem, for instance. So, of course, Milner was using Lisp, like, like everyone in artificial intelligence and theorem proving at that time. But Lisp would not do because it doesn't let you uh, define uh, abstract types. Hence, Milner invented ML, a functional and imperative language with strong static typing and type abstraction. And uh, Milner also wanted the types to not get in the way and that users should write programs pretty much like they would write them in Lisp without type annotations. So he studied uh, type inference and noticed that type of function parameters can be inferred from their uses. Uh, here, for instance, uh, in this function, uh, it's obvious that x and y are booleans because that's how they are used. But what if types of function parameters cannot be inferred, as in fun x or x, where the use of x doesn't tell us anything about the type of x? Uh, earlier work by Hindley, a logician, uh, uh, for the simply type lambda calculus uh, would lead to giving type alpha or alpha for some fixed unknown type alpha. And Milner noticed that uh, this function identity could be given a type schema for all alpha, alpha or alpha, that denotes a polymorphic function that can be used at uh, several different types. Um, so that was really the beginning of ML. But one thing was still missing, uh, which is uh, support for user-defined data structures. So in LCFML, there are built-in product types and some types, but all other data types are defined as abstract types plus constructor functions plus accessor functions. For instance, here we have binary trees with values of type star, at least. So a tree is either a star or a pair of two star trees. And it has constructor functions, leaf and node, uh, the predicate is leaf, and projection functions, leaf val, left child, right child, that can all fail at one time. And it's only at the, in the very early uh, 80s that uh, uh, inductive types and pattern matching were added to uh, LCFML. Uh, various work by Burstall, McQueen, Milner, Ideni Ma, and Guy Cousineau in Paris, with some inspiration from Hope, an experimental language of Burstall, and perhaps also from Prolog. 
And so we went at that time, they went from type to Lisp that you can see on the left to uh, core ML with a data type definition and a function defined by pattern matching over the tree. And so that gave uh, core ML as we know it today. So this very nice combination of a call by value functional language, inductive types with pattern matching, and uh, Hindley Milner polymorphic types and uh, type inference. And, and from that uh, our initial design uh, emerged uh, an incredible number of uh, languages. And it was kind of the primordial soup. Okay, from which emerged at least three uh, lines of functional uh, type functional languages. The one uh, one was standard ML, so led by Milner at Edinburgh, and mm -hmm. moving towards uh, uh, standardization and formal definition, but also adding modules. We will talk about that later. Uh, another one was a pure functional programming line of work with early languages like Miranda and LazyML and the convergence uh, around Haskell in around 1992. And the third one is uh, the Camel branch, the French branch, if you want, which we are going to talk more about today. So what about this uh, Camel? Uh, language. So that was a result of a work by Guy Cousineau and Gerard Wett uh, at INRIA and University Paris 7 and later at ENS in the early 80s, later joined by uh, Michel Moni, Skander Suarez, Pierre Weiss. And basically, it was a core ML plus facilities for embedded languages like parser quotations and type quotations, kind of thing we do with Camel P4 or Camel P5 these days. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide a bit of uh, uh, camel code. Uh, well, it should look pretty familiar to you when there's a where rec construct that we no longer have. Constructors have quotes and at the bottom you see uh, the use of quotations and anti-quotations to use a concrete syntax for plus and for addition and multiplication, your little language of expressions, as uh, patterns. So it was developed along the Coq proof assistant, basically at Coq's implementation language. Uh, so in the early 80s, uh, uh, Gerard decided that uh, the calculus of constructions would be implemented not in Lisp, as his previous project, but in a language with more types. And, and so he chose uh, ML uh, for that. Um, but what, what gives uh, Camel its name is actually its implementation technology. So it's ML running on the CAM. And uh, so it, it was implemented on top of a Lisp runtime system, the LULISP system, and it's LLM3 virtual machine. Uh, but it would not, unlike earlier ML implementations, it would not translate to Lisp and then compile the generated Lisp. It would compile through an intermediate language based on the CAM, the Categorical Abstract Machine, uh, which was worked by Guy Cousineau, Pierre-Louis Curien, Michel Mouni. A simple evaluation model for call by value inspired by Cartesian closed categories. Uh, are categories where products and function spaces are dual. And so, uh, well, I've written the, the, the base, uh, basic compilation scheme below, which is how code that transform, takes the environment at the top of the stack and leaves the value of the expression at the top of the stack. And what is notable about the CAM is that it was one of the first formalizations and formal discourse about function closures. Uh, before, function closures were well known, but just as an implementation device for uh, uh, functions as first class values. Here they were kind of connected with a bit of a theory, and, and that was very interesting. Uh, what was disappointing with the CAM is a, a lack of performance. Uh, each binding, each LED binding, each function parameter being passed to a function uh, would result in a cons, in a heap allocated cons cell, and uh, the environment would have the structure of a list, so no constant time access. And it's about at that time that I hear about Camel for the first time. 
Uh, so I was, uh, I was a student at ENS and Guy Cousineau was one of my professors. And one day I went to see him to discuss internship possibilities and told him I would be interested in an internship in, in, in systems or maybe uh, compilers. And he told me, uh, je connais un langage où il y a un gros travail de compilation à faire. Let me tell you about a programming language where there is much compilation work to do. And then he proceeded to demonstrate uh, Camel on the big screen of his Sun workstation. And I was completely uh, blown away. I mean, this didn't look like, like any of the uh, languages I knew uh, at that time. And it looked so much more sophisticated and advanced and, and pleasant to use and so on and so forth. So I did a short internship on, on Camel, learning about the language, but also about its implementation which actually was written in Camel, so it was bootstrapped, so I could see uh, that it was a very good language for writing uh, compilers and language processors, basically. And uh, in 1989, um, two things happened. Uh, so first, uh, Damien de Liger, who was a classmate of mine at ENS, uh, started a master's thesis on garbage collection and memory management. And I was still thinking about the CAM and why it is inefficient and how we could do better, have more efficient abstract machines for call by value functional languages. And so we decided to do an experiment. It was called Zinc. It was a new style recursive acronym for Zinc is not CAMEL. And the idea was to implement uh, core ML, a really simplified CAMEL language, uh, using uh, Damien's efficient generational garbage collectors and using an abstract machine that I was designing, the Zinc abstract machine, the ZAM, where bindings uh, use a stack, like in every other uh, virtual machine for every other language, but uh, are heap allocated only when closures are required. And, uh, and there was actually a bit of theory too behind the ZAM, because it could be explained in terms of the uh, calculus of explicit substitutions, the lambda sigma calculus that Pierre Ricurie and others were working on at that time. And since time was short and we didn't know how to write native code compilers, we decided to do a bytecode interpreter written in C. And the results were pretty interesting performance-wise. Uh, we were competitive with Camel despite the overhead of the bytecode interpreter. And then, uh, well, then the project was kind of put on the back burner for a while when I was starting my PhD on a different topic and, uh, and came back to life in 1991. Uh, there was really a strong uh, desire to use uh, ML languages for teaching and the long implementations like CAMEL were not appropriate. Uh, they were expensive, it was commercial software and uh, required big expensive machines to honor. And really, the current state of the, the art was, was pretty poor otherwise. I remember uh, hearing, uh, playing with a uh, SML interpreter uh, written in C, running in MS-DOS, that would basically crash after a few sentences. And, and I thought I could do better um, based on Zinc. And so, uh, with help from Damien Deliger and also Pierre Weiss and Michel Mooney, uh, we basically completed the Zinc experiment to get a practically usable ML implementation that could be used for teaching. So that meant adding type checking and type inference, which were uh, omitted in the Zinc experiment, uh, uh, implementing separate compilation and linking, and that's when I decided to use modular 2 style modules with an implementation file.ml and an interface file.ml that can hide some of the uh, aspects of the implementation. There was also a top-level interactive report. Uh, it was bootstrapped and uh, uh, was quite portable. So we made it available for Unix workstation stations, but also uh, there was a port for the original Mac OS and even a port for MS-DOS running in painfully in 640K of RAM. And and it was quite successful in higher education, especially uh, so for undergraduate uh, CS courses, sometimes first uh, uh, programming class, uh, especially in France. So these are some of the books uh, that were written, uh, textbooks that were written in the 90s, 
corresponding to, to lectures being given in camel uh, light. Um, and then uh, perhaps the next step, a few years later, was uh, trying to understand the standard ML module language. So standard ML had this uh, very nice uh, language feature for programming in the large, including modules, structures that could be given multiple interfaces, signatures, could be parameterized by other modules, these are called functors, with uh, sharing constraints between the arguments, etc., etc. Uh, but that module language was also uh, mysterious, as presented in, in papers and in the definition of standard ML. Uh, basically, uh, it was given complex type checking rules uh, based on uh, algorithmic type checking rules, let's say, based on an internal DAG like representations with unique names representing types, at least, basically type identity, but also substructures had names, uh, a unique identity. And I and, and several other people in the program, type programming language community uh, were wanting to, to, to explain standard ML modules in more type theoretic terms. Okay? Like for all an exist quantification that give a good account of polymorphism and type abstraction, maybe dependent types, maybe something else. And, and the solution came in, in 93. Um, called it manifest types, but maybe I was only the second one to find it because uh, Robert Harper and Mark Lillibridge at CMU were working in parallel on very similar ideas. So we had two papers back to back at Purple 94. And, and, but, but really, the, the crucial idea was this uh, uh, ability to put in signatures equations between types, like type u is actually equal to x dot t. And that accounts for type propagation through functors, but also for sharing constraints to some extent. And eventually that led me to, uh, to start the Camel Special Light project, which was uh, a language and an implementation. So the language was a core Camel Light language, plus uh, an implementation of this new approach to, uh, to standard ML modules using syntactic signatures and manifest types. And uh, the implementation was reusing much of the camel light runtime system, including uh, an improved uh, abstract machine, the ZAM2, by code compiler and interpreter, but also for the first time a native code compiler. And, uh, and that uh, came out of some earlier experiments of mine on type-directed unboxed data representations which were not completely positive, so, uh, but, but had me, I had to do a, a compilation to native code because uh, with bytecode you can't really evaluate the impact of unboxing. Um, so that was uh, released in, uh, publicly in September 1995. And again, here is the announcement. And actually, maybe this is the announcement we should be celebrating or we should have celebrated last year. Uh, because uh, if you look at OCaml today, uh, it still has uh, lots of things that, that date back to uh, the Camel Special Light project, uh, especially in the implementation and the structure of the implementation, which hasn't changed much. And this brings us to uh, Objective Camel, and which is essentially an object or an extension of Camel Special Light with some object-oriented features. And so I guess I have to explain why objects. Uh, and the answer is that objects, uh, object orientation was really a hot topic in the 1990s. Um, it was kind of a wave that swept industry and software engineering. Uh, many new programming methodologies were being developed on top of uh, uh, object and class decompositions. And industry has uh, fallen in love with C++. Uh, so this is a great language. We will never need any, any other language in the future. And so non-object-oriented uh, programming languages were seen as basically irrelevant and things from the past. Uh, 
But it was not just fashionable. Our object orientation was also a, a puzzle, a challenge for programming language theory. Uh, it's trivial to give untyped semantics to object languages, but it, it was uh, extremely hard to explain uh, object orientation in, in terms of types. And many, many surprises uh, happened, for instance, in 1990, uh, this paper on the top, Inheritance is not typing, came as a complete surprise to, to many. Uh, it found an unsoundness in the uh, first version of the Eiffel language, and, and for software engineering people, it couldn't be that inheritance and subtyping were not the same notion. Um, also, there were issues of structural versus nominal types. There were uh, failed attempts at encoding objects in terms of uh, well, subtypes, existential quantification, etc. Uh, so much so that Abadi and Cardelli, for instance, developed a whole new uh, formalization of uh, objects, kind of a lambda calculus of objects. The basic notion is not lambda abstraction, but object abstraction. Uh, there was also this full series of workshops that was held uh, uh, along uh, Popol conferences. So full is Foundations of object oriented Languages, and it was initiated by Benjamin Pierce and other luminaries in type systems. And, and so every year we would basically see attempts that didn't work at, at, at giving foundations to object oriented languages. So that was really a, a hot topic. And, uh, and in, in the uh, Camel Group at Inria, so Didier Remy and his PhD student Jérôme Bouillon were working on an approach uh, to objects based on raw polymorphism. So rows, uh, raw polymorphism is something that Didier worked on earlier. Uh, to, to reason about extensible hyperbs. And rows give a way to, for a type system to keep track of the names and types of methods. Uh, and row variables uh, can keep track of the other not yet known methods. Okay, so for instance, you could say, well, I have M, a method M of type int, and maybe some other method O1. And someone else could say, I have a method K of type bool, and maybe some other uh, uh, O2. And they can reconcile their viewpoint by saying, okay, we have M of type in, K of type bool, and maybe some other O. Or they could also close the method, the, the type, saying, okay, all I have is M of type in. And, and this approach is perfect for inferring the type of an object from its use, uh, like in Damas Miller type inference. Uh, as, you, as you see here, this function that takes X and invokes name and rank uh, methods. Uh, as this type, a method name of type string, a rank of type int, maybe some other methods, and then in return a string. And so this gives a form of polymorphism over objects, which is parametric polymorphism. It's not subtype polymorphism, but subtyping can be recovered by explicit coercions. And that was the uh, uh, basis for uh, Objective Camel 1.00, which was designed by Vouillon and Remy and implemented by Vouillon. Uh, taking camel special light, adding objects with raw polymorphism in the core language, and adding a sub-language for classes, classes being viewed as object generators, that supported a lot of features of object-oriented languages, multiple inheritance, self-type specialization, binary methods, pretty much everything was fitting quite naturally. So at the bottom you see um, um, how you can define printable color points by inheriting from color points and printable points and uh, making self references and super references and etc. And that was announced on May uh, 96. And the reactions were very interesting as far as I can remember them. From the full community, the PL theorists, there was a polite lack of interest. Basically, oh, that's nice, but it's not enough like Java, or not exactly what I would like to do. Or, uh, and, and, and it was, it started to be obvious that basically nobody would ever agree on, on, on a single approach uh, to typed object oriented program. Early adopters of ML, including Camel Light and Camel Special Light uh, fans, uh, showed some slight concern. Uh, oh, uh, you're not giving up on functional programming, right? Uh, the, and, and they had to be reassured. But uh, we got many newcomers uh, that were, I guess, reassured by the availability of objects, something they, that were familiar to them. 
Uh, but then could learn rather quickly uh, how to do without objects and use uh, functions and data types instead. So that led Eric Meyer to quit at uh, OCaml with the rehabilitation clinic for object-oriented programmers. Why not? And, and that's also uh, when we started to have uh, serious users outside the relatively small community, French community and uh, theorem prover community. Um, there are two uh, influential uh, early uses of uh, Camel Specialized and OCaml. Uh, the first is ActiveRML, that was a project at Microsoft Research to develop a domain specific language for animated 3D scenes. And the second was uh, initially called HorSML and then became the Ensemble project uh, developed at Cornell and later at IBM as a toolkit for building distributed applications. And those two examples are important because, well, first, uh, they managed to convince in Ria's management that Camel was a serious language, not just a toy uh, to be used internally to implement their improvers. And second, uh, both uh, uh, applications were quite demanding in terms of uh, uh, implementation. Uh, ActiveRML, well, they, they actually ported parts of, uh, of Camel to Windows and uh, then had to encapsulate everything into a DLL. And for HorSML and later Ensemble, they uh, managed to uh, achieve excellent uh, performances uh, by controlling latency uh, and, and garbage collection pauses very precisely. I think that was the beginning of an unexpected at the time affinity between OCaml and systems programming, which still exists today. Uh, you can still see a strong systems programming culture at, uh, at OCaml Labs, at uh, Jane Street, at uh, OCaml Pro. And, uh, and I think that among the uh, 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 high level languages for mostly intended for functional, for, yeah, for symbolic processing, uh, OCaml has been one of the most successful for uh, systems applications too. So then, well, the, the language and the system matured over the years. So I have listed the, the major uh, evolutions of, of uh, Objective Camel, which at some point became known as OCaml. Uh, version 2.00 in 1998 was a complete revision of the class language for objects, so using something that was uh, putting something that was more flexible and um, enabled more, more uh, interactions between the core language and the class language. Version 3.00, which I will talk about uh, just next, uh, was uh, introduction of labels, uh, labeled and optional arguments, but also polymorphic variants. 3.05 was about uh, polymorphic functions as first class values, provided they are put in record fields or methods of objects. 3.07 was um, experimental implementation of recursive module definitions, which actually stayed, uh, but it's still not very good. And I can say that with confidence because it was my design. 308 uh, was about immediate objects, with the ability to build objects in the core language without going through the class uh, system. 3.12 introduced uh, polymorphic recursion uh, and also first class modules. I'll say a few words about that. And perhaps the latest really big uh, uh, evolution was for the 00 in 2012, which was the introduction of generalized algebraic data types known as GLDT. And well, let me zoom quickly and re in those extensions because I think they, they kind of illustrate uh, how, we, uh, how and why we were prompted to, to, to extend the language in various directions. So for the labeled optional arguments and the extensible variants, so these were, this came from the work of Jacques Garrigue, uh, a prototype called Olabel, which we decided to merge in OCaml 3.00. And Jacques' uh, motivation was very much to better support libraries, um, especially complicated libraries with functions that take many arguments, so it's important to uh, be able to name them, to uh, distinguish them, or optional arguments to reduce the clutter 
at invocation, and polymorphic variants were uh, an attempt to mix and match data constructors more freely than declared constructors, and in particular have functions that can only take a subset of, of a set of constructors. And, and those extensions were very much motivated by libraries and especially uh, graphic, graphical user interface toolkits. Uh, Camel Light had a uh, binding to the TK uh, GUI that was pretty awful with functions that would take lots of arguments and lists of options and would fail at one time if you gave the wrong option to the wrong function. So that's, uh, uh, that was one of the motivations for this line of work, which are continued with level TK and level GTK. A second uh, extension I'd like to, to mention is modules as first class values. That was implemented by Alain Frisch, but the design came uh, from Claudio Russo uh, for Moscow MR. And the idea was to give uh, more power to more flexibility to modular programming uh, by encapsulating as first class values modules and, and uh, manipulating those, those uh, encapsulated modules by uh, the core language. And of course, there was a, a desire to be uh, to do more with modules, in particular, like runtime selection between several implementations of a structure, etc. And we could have uh, added more constructs to the module language, like an if then else, maybe a pattern match, maybe something else. But that would only kind of increase the all, well, that would create redundancy between the two languages, core language and module language. And this device of encapsulating a module as a first class value and then manipulating just like any value of the language, putting it in a hash table, as in this example, recovering it by name found at runtime, and then projecting it back to a module. Uh, well, this device avoided uh, all, all that uh, redundancy and gave a lot of uh, power to uh, modular program. And finally, the last uh, extension I would mention quickly is generalized algebraic data types. So that was implemented by uh, Jacques Lenormand under supervision by Jacques Garrig and Anna Frisch, based on old ideas by many, as you will see on the next slide. And, and in retrospect, it's a pretty obvious idea that constructors of parameterized data types, alpha ty, uh, may not all produce alpha ty results. For instance, for a type uh, alpha compact array of, of memory efficient arrays, you can have a default case which takes an alpha array, works for any alpha, and you can have special cases when that takes a byte and it uh, implements a char array, and when that takes a bit vector and implements a Boolean array. And the devol is in the details of pattern matching, and in particular on how you type a pattern matching and how you infer the type of the result of a pattern matching. And that took uh, many years to be solved, actually. Um, so, so ideas, well, maybe the first ideas for GADDs appear, well, first in the theorem proving community, uh, in, in COC, for instance, the calculus of inductive constructions. But in the programming world, well, it's, uh, oh, there's the work of Laufer in 1992 on existential types, which is a special case of GADTs. Then in 1995, Augustson and Peterson uh, write a draft that would never be published called Silly Type Families, where they basically uh, say, OK, it would be interesting to have GADTs, but uh, there will be problems to infer the types of match. And, and that was uh, largely ignored, in particular by the Haskell community. Uh, until, uh, well, 2003, when she, Chen and Chen, reinvented pretty much the same ideas as Augustine and Peterson nine years earlier. And then the community started to work on uh, algorithms for partial type inference uh, around Simon Payton Jones in, in the Haskell community and uh, around Francois Petit and Diana Gigianas in the Camel community. And, and so GDTs were introduced quickly in Haskell 2007. And we waited a little more for Camel before the, the, the design and the typing holes really stabilized. So just to, to emphasize that good ideas take time to emerge and take time to uh, actually be ready for integration in a programming language. So, <clears throat> so since 4.0.0, we had many additions to the language, but much more incremental in nature. It's not to say that they are not useful. 
For instance, the match with exception construct introduced in 402 is great. And extensible data types are pretty nice. We also have inline records, more recently, objectivity annotations and type constructors. We have that kind of uh, 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 small enhancements. And in progress, where we've been working hard at merging multi core OCAMR, and that will be the next big thing, and provide basic support for shared memory parallelism. Uh, and there's work in progress, but still uh, not, not, uh, not quite ready on having some forms of algebraic effects, in particular to simplify, uh, to, to, to give a nicer um, interface to uh, parallelism, and a modular implicits to build some kind of bridge between modules and type classes. All right, so, um, well, this is what I wanted to say um, for this retrospective. Um, so, a few remarks to conclude. Um, first, uh, OCaml is a language that evolved gradually. In '96, Guy Cousineau wrote a short history of Camel up to 1996 and concluded that certainly, seen from 1996, the story of Camel could have been more linear. And well, since 2021, it could also have been lin more linear. Uh, but that's the way uh, languages evolve, I guess. Um, I would claim that the language is still faithful to its roots. Uh, it's a mostly functional language, but has imperative and object-oriented power when they are needed. It is very much built on structure around the types. Uh, types provide the skeleton of the language, give it structure all strength. And well, this is a line of programming language design that says, and basically, Languages with no types or weak types don't have a structure, they don't have a spine, they look like jellyfish. And uh, JavaScript is, I guess, a good example of that. And finally, there is uh, a lot of respect for type inference and the existence of principal types. Uh, in the early days of Camel, it was really fanatical devotion, and these days it's more like lip service. Uh, but I think it's an important aspect of the design that uh, we are trying. We use types, but we are trying to uh, also support uh, type inference and make sure that the inferred types are always principal. There is no better choice. That can sound like an arbitrary constraint and that limits us. We could have many more features that just don't fit in a type inference framework. On the other hand, I would like to recall you that beauty can come out of formal constraints. Uh, think of the sonnet, think of the still life, think of the fugue. These are all very constrained forms that, that kind of forced artists to come up with new ideas. And I think uh, uh, type inference is also one of those constraints that forced uh, programming language people to come up with new ideas. And finally, uh, when I prepared this talk, I really wanted to also talk about the emergence of an active community of OCaml users, because programming languages don't go in a vacuum. And, and then I realized that I had really very little to say except platitudes, so I'd rather stop here and, and discuss those aspects in the questions. Uh, what is obvious is that there have been much collective effort, uh, exemplified in this OCaml workshop and in many other uh, uh, places of exchange uh, in the community. And, uh, well, thanks to all for the many contributions, and please uh, keep up the good work. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions now. <laughs>